Okay, so we are on Bayes on the Bayes. We are 2B. So we're in the middle of a, of a quite a heavy discussion on trying to understand the nature of the verses and how we come to the conclusion that with respect to canceling the Saita due to the fact that we know that she's engaged intimately with the person that she has secluded herself with, uh, that that, that uh, piece of information can be brought to us even by one witness. So just to run through it quickly, we have two witnesses at the moment that the husband warns the wife. That's the primary uh, stage in creating the law of the Saita. So it requires two witnesses at that moment when he warns his wife. From there, we have a dispute as to how many witnesses have to be present at the moment that she secludes herself with this man. So that's stage two in the Saita where she secludes herself with the man that he was, she was warned about. And there we have a dispute between a Bishu and a Belezer as to whether or not you need one witness or two witnesses at that moment. But the third element, which the Mishnah was silent, was quiet on, and the Gemara comments now about, is the, the cancellation of the Saita. If we know that she engaged physically with the person behind closed doors, we cancel the Saita. Because the whole law of the Saita is to determine whether or not she behaved behind closed doors, which would require us to be unaware of what happened behind those doors. And therefore, if we do know what happened, we do know that she engaged physically, the law of the Saita is called off. So how many people do we need to testify before us that they saw the two of them engage physically. And we've determined that only one person is required. So at the moment now, the way we know this is because the verse states that when she was behind closed doors, the aid ain ba, there was no witness there. This word witness aid, we said, translates not as witness in the singular, but rather as testimony which a testimony is only valid if two people are there. And therefore, when the verse says there is no testimony, it means there's no complete testimony. There's no two people, but there is one. And this one person is believed who sees that she wasn't, uh, that she was physical and wasn't raped. And therefore, she's not, um, the law of the site is canceled. But that's only because there's one witness. And we derive that because the word aid means testimony not witness. And because it means testimony, and we say there is no testimony, it means there's no complete testimony, but there is a partial testimony in the, in, in the, in the um, way of a single witness. Now, how do we know that the word aid doesn't mean a witness, but rather means a testimony of two people? So that's what we did yesterday. We introduced this verse, which says, <laughs> that one, one witness uh, is not enough to establish any matter. And this phrase, one witness, the word one, by the way, Rabbi Gimbal emailed me, um, correcting me, and I thank him for that. And in general, I, I mentioned this in the past before, as the best kind of emails to get in the middle of the day, someone's learning the Gemara and thinking about it. So anyway, he corrected me in saying that the word bi'ish is not talking about the witness, it's talking about the defendant. But the, the principle still stands in that, the witness, the verse says, do not establish a matter based on one witness. So the fact that it says the word one, after the word witness, even the word witness itself is singular, is a redundancy. One witness, just say a witness. Why one witness? To teach you that generally speaking, the word a, the word witness doesn't mean witness, but means testimony, which is two people, unless the verse says one. So any time throughout all of Torah, where you have the word aid, you should understand it to mean a testimony of two people, unless the verse says one. Okay, so now that we have this universal principle, this binyan av, this universal principle, that the word aid means testimony, which is at least two people. And the verse by Saita says, we do not have an aid. We do not have a testimony. We do not have two people, but we do have one. And that one person knows that the two were engaged physically and that she wasn't raped. And therefore the law of the Saita is, cut, is called off. And thus, we have determined from the verses themselves that the law of the Saita is canceled on the testimony of one person who says the two were engaged physically. Okay, I hope that's somewhat clear. Is that clear? Okay, so now, if it's unclear, please unmute yourself and you can ask. So now what the Gemara is going to do is, it's a little bit, um, it's, it might be a little difficult to follow, um, but, but remember this. 
the Gemara is going to go through now an exercise of what I would have thought. So everything the Gemara is going to be doing now is not the actual conclusion. The conclusion remains as we just said it. One witness is enough to establish. One witness who comes and says, I saw the two of them engage physically, that's enough to cancel the Saita, as long as he comes back and says it was willingly and no rape. Because if there's rape, then there's different laws. But if there's no rape, and it was willingly, law of the site was canceled, even though it's one witness saying this. Now, the Gemara is going to do now is, the Gemara is going to go through in an exercise of what I would have thought. So all the things we're about to say now are not the conclusion. Okay. So what does this mean, I, what, what I would have thought? It means as follows. The Gemara is saying, said that, how do we know that we have one witness here in the case of the Saita? Because we have a universal principle that the word aid means testimony of two people rather than a witness in the singular. Now the Gemara is asking, why do I need to rely on that universal principle? The verses themselves, if analyzed correctly, would lead me to the same conclusion. It would lead me to the same conclusion that one witness is enough and believed in the case of the Saita, to cancel the Saita because one witness says they were engaged physically. And I do not need to rely on the universal principle. So the entirety of the exercise is going to be, what would have I thought had I not had the universal principle in just reading the verse of the site itself? Would I have come to the conclusion that we need two witnesses? And therefore, I must rely on the universal principle to tell me, no, you only need one, one witness. Hope that's clear. That's what the Gemara is going to do now. It's all going to be an exercise in what I would have thought had I not had the universal principle. Thus, at the end, it's going to be that I would have thought I need two. And thanks to the universal principle, it informs me, no, nope, you only need one. The universal principle being that the word aid means testimony. And therefore, when the verse here says there isn't a aid, it means there's no two, but there is one. So had I not had the universal principle, I would have thought that the word aid here by Saita means two people. And the question is, why would I have thought that? Why would I have thought that the word here aid means two? and that I need to have two witnesses to cancel the site. So why would I have thought that? And therefore only the universal principle tells me, nope, one is enough. I hope that's clear. So again, we're in an exercise of what I would have thought without the universal principle. So this is how the Gemara introduces it. It's right here. You can see my cursor, it's right there. It's, uh, it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six lines from the top of the page. Morning, Alan. Nice to see you here. Welcome. I'm going to mute. Morning. If you need to ask any questions, please unmute yourself. Okay. So the verse reads. So the Gemara reads like this: El Arbat Taima. The reason why you concluded that the word aid in our that, that the reason why you concluded that in the law of the Saita, one witness is enough to tell us that they were intimate and therefore the law of the site is called off. The reason why you came to that conclusion is because the ksiv, because the verse reads with respect to the universal principle, because we're relying on the universal principle that teaches us that the word aid means testimony of two people. And therefore when our verse in Saita says we have no aid, it means we don't have two, but we do have one. That's why you came to the conclusion. But had you not had that universal principle, what would I have thought? Hava Amina, I would have thought, aid de Saita, that the word aid by the law of the Saita means chad one person. Chad is one. And so in other words, like this the word aid is established to mean two. And therefore, when the verse says we don't have an aid, it means we have we don't have two, we only have one. Now, had we not had the universal principle, presumably, I would have thought that the word aid doesn't mean testimony, it means witness in the singular. Okay, so now read the verse. That would mean you don't even have one witness because the verse by Saita says you don't have an aid. If the word aid means one witness because we're not relying on the universal principle, then that would mean we don't have even one witness. Now, if that's the case, El Bamai Mistera. In what, in what sense is she becoming forbidden to her husband? There's, there isn't even one witness to tell us they were, they, were, they were behind closed doors. 
right? Because the verse says, there's no witness to what happened and she wasn't raped. So if there's no witness and nobody saw that they were secluded and nobody saw that she wasn't raped, then why is she becoming forbidden to her husband? In other words, the verse itself implies that we know some information about this, what happened. So even if we didn't have the universal principle, we must assume that this verse is telling us we know something about it, at least from the mouth of one witness. So why did the Gemara tell us yesterday that we need to rely on the universal principle? That the word aid means two witnesses. And therefore in the verse in our, in our it by sight that says you don't have an aid, it means you don't have two, you only have one. Seemingly the verse itself informs you, you at least have to have one witness because the verse concludes that you know some information. How does the verse know you conclude? How do I know that the verse is telling me I conclude some information? Because the verse says that the woman is forbidden to her husband. How is she forbidden to her husband if we know nothing about it? If we have no witness, we don't know they were secluded. We don't know she wasn't raped. We don't know she wasn't, uh, she was intimate or not intimate. There's, there's no witness. So, so what are we going on? So the Gemara is kind of compelling us to say that even without the universal principle, just this verse itself, which implies that you know some information, means that you must have at least one witness. And therefore, the word aid, which says you have no witness, means you don't have two witnesses. Because otherwise, what information are we going on? In the words of the Gemara, al bamai mistra, I'm not sure pronounce the word, mitzra, in what way is she becoming forbidden to her husband if we have no information? So why do I need this universal principle to teach me that the site uh, that to teach me that the word aid always means two. And if we're in the verse over here by Sartre says you don't have two, it means you don't have two, you, don't, you only have one. Seemingly, the verse itself implies you at least have one witness considering that the verse assumes you know information about what happened to the point that you're making the husband and wife be forbidden to each other. She said to come like this. No, it's the, I do require the universal law to teach me that the word aid means two. And therefore, when the verse by Saita says you don't have an aid, it means you don't have two, but you have one. Because here's what I would have thought had I not had the universal principle. So I would have thought to say, aid, ain't ba, that what does it mean you don't have a witness? It doesn't mean that there is no physical witness. It means a neman ba. It means you don't believe the witness. In other words, like this. I would have thought that the word aid means singular because there's no universal principle. Now, if so, how do I know what's going on behind? How do I know that they were that they were secluded at all if I have no witness? Answer: You do have a witness. You just don't believe them. A nemanba. When the verse says you don't have a witness, it doesn't mean you actually don't have anybody present. Someone's there. You just don't believe it. But the Gemara says, hold on a second. A nemanba. We don't believe this one witness. Vela my boy. Then what would you need to believe? That means you need to have at least two witnesses to tell us, otherwise you don't believe them. So if, if the Gemara say, if the verse is saying, you have no witness, not that you don't have a witness there, you do have one witness, but you don't believe them because you need to have two to believe them. If that's what the verse would have meant, then the verse shouldn't say anything. If the Torah wanted to say that by Saita, you don't believe him unless you have two witnesses, then that is exactly as it is throughout all of Torah. If that's the case, don't say anything. Just say, we know or don't know, and we'll know from all over Torah that you have to have two to, 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 um, to, to believe. Specifically, the, the Gemara says, Dover, Dover, Mimamain. The word Dover appears in the laws of monetary issues. This word dover, which means a matter. Do not don't establish a matter unless you have two witnesses. So anytime the Torah says a matter, it's compared to that word, and thus you have to have two witnesses. All to say that if the Torah is telling me by the law of the Saita not to believe this one witness, then don't say anything. Don't say anything. Don't say anything about witnesses being there. And we will know based on the fact that all of Torah, you have to have two witnesses. You need to have two witnesses here too. Why say anything at all? So all to say that the verse itself, from the very fact that the verse of the Saito says that we know some information, and yet we yet it says, Ain Aidba, you have no witness. 
means you have one but not two. And it must be that we believe that one witness because if we didn't believe that one witness, then the Torah wouldn't have to say, you don't have a witness. Don't say anything. And we know you don't, have to, you don't believe one witness because that's the universal rule of all Torah. So all to say that the verse itself implies you have one witness and not two because we know some information. And yet the verse says you don't have a witness, which means you must have one witness, at least just not two witnesses. And therefore the Gemara gets back to its original question, why do I need to rely on the binyan av, on the verse which says that the, on the universal principle, that the word aid means a testimony to. I don't need to rely on that. The verse itself implies that there's at least one witness there. Is that somewhat clear? I hope it's a little bit, uh, it could be a little bit convoluted. Is that somewhat clear? Some reaction a little bit difficult? It is, Rabbi. It is clear. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Says the Gemara, no, it's there. I need the universal principle. I need the, the Torah to teach me. And I need the Gemara to tell me that the word aid means a testimony. Because if I didn't have that principle, I would have thought that Saita shiny, that Saita is an exception to the rule. Why? Because there literally means there's feet. There's legs for the story to stand on. Because he warned her, and she was secluded. And therefore, this um, and therefore, you would have believed one witness. So just to explain what the Gemara means like this. At this point, we're saying that we could read the verse to mean that you don't have witnesses. I'm sorry, you don't have witnesses doesn't mean you don't have witnesses at all. It means you don't have a witness and you don't believe that witness. Meaning you have a single person saying a story, but you don't believe them. And now we're asking if the verse is coming to tell you that you don't believe the single witness. We know that already. You never believe a single witness. The verse wouldn't have to say that. It says the Gemara, no, no, no. The verse needs to tell you by Saita that you, don't, that you don't believe a single witness. Again, this is what I would have thought, not the conclusion. I would have thought that the Saita needs a special verse to tell you that you don't believe one witness because of how, uh, uh, because of how well grounded the story is because he warned her already. She's been secluded. They have trouble in their marriage. So we already know him and we're already involved in this story. So there is context in which it would make sense that she was secluded with this guy. And therefore I would have thought that I do believe one witness, and therefore I would have read the verse to mean, don't believe the one witness. And this is how I would have thought about it had I not had the universal principle that the word aid means to. Right? So again, the word aid in our would have thought without the universal principle means one witness. And then when the verse says you don't have one witness, it means you don't believe the one witness. And the reason why the verse has to tell me that I don't believe the one witness, even though I always, I never believe one witness, is because in the case of the site, I would have thought that maybe there's an exception, you are allowed to believe one witness. So without the universal principle, I would have thought, you don't even believe one. Okay. So the more it says, um, matis amnes, de ein would you have concluded that you don't believe the one witness? Visharia? And that would mean, if I don't believe the one witness who saw that they were, right right now in this reading of the verse, we're saying that when the verse says you have no witness in the singular, because we're not relying on the universal principle, we're sticking with the translation that the word aid means singular witness. So you have no witness means you don't believe the single witness. Even though I never believe single witnesses, the verse has to tell it to me now because I might've thought so as an exception. Okay, so you don't believe the single witness. Now, if you don't believe the single witness who tells you that the two of them were physically intimate, that means she's allowed to be with her husband because there's no testimony to say otherwise. Or at least we don't believe the single witness. But says the Gemara of Amidic civil in Esposa, the verse then goes on to say that we know she wasn't raped. Why is the verse adding the line she does, that she wasn't raped? Michal, the implication is, Dasura, that she's forbidden to be with her husband because she wasn't raped, because she was engaged willingly. That means we do believe up with the witness. See, it's, it's a catch-22. Because on the one hand, the verse is saying, you have no testimony. But on the other hand, the verse says, we know something about what happened because we know she wasn't raped. And because she wasn't raped, she can't be with her husband. So are we believing that one witness? Or are we not believing that one witness? In the reading of the Gemara right now, where the word aid 
means a singular witness. And when the verse says you have no single witness, it doesn't mean he's not there. It means you don't believe the single witness. Well, if you don't believe the single witness, then why is she forbidden to her husband? Let her go and enjoy her husband's company. We don't believe the single witness. Why would the verse then go on to say, we know she's not raped. Why is that relevant? We don't believe the single witness anyway. Let her go back to her husband. Ah, the verse is saying we know she wasn't raped. That's because we want her to be forbidden to her husband because she willingly engaged with another guy. Ah, she willingly engaged with another guy. That means we are believing that witness. Okay. All to say that at this point in the Gemara, the reading of the verse would make sense even without the universal principle that the, that the, um, I'm sorry, all to say that without the universal principle of, I'm sorry, even without the universal principle of aid being a testimony of two, I would still come to the conclusion. No, sorry, I, I, I could have come to the conclusion. I would have come to the conclusion that even the single witness, I sorry, I would have still come to the conclusion that the single witness is believed. Even without the universal principle that aid means a testimony. Why would I come to the conclusion that the single witness is, is believed? Because at the end, the verse says she wasn't raped, implying that she's forbidden to go to her husband. And if she, she's forbidden to go to her husband, that means we are accepting the testimony of at least one person who's telling us that she was engaged physically, and that's why she can't be with her husband. So even without the universal principle that the word aid means testimony, I would still conclude that the one person is believed. And therefore, what do I need the universal principle for? So it's to go more like this. So it looks like we're back to square one on that same question. Correct. Correct. That's what the Gemara is going back. And, that's why. I, that's why I said at the beginning the Gemara is going back and forth and what I would have thought. Right. So we're back to the same question of you must conclude from our verse that you're at least believing one witness. Otherwise, how, how are we making her forbidden to her husband? So what does it mean? In other words, think of the two phrases of the verse. She has no witness, but we know for sure she wasn't raped. Well, if she has no witness, how do we know she wasn't raped? Answer, she must have had one witness, not two. If that's the case, then the verse itself tells me that. I don't need to have the, the universal principle that the word aid means a testimony of two. Just from the very fact that the verse says you have no witness, and yet we know some information, and we believe to the point that she can't go back to her husband, that itself implies that we have some form of testimony, which would mean you have one testimony, one person. So I don't need to rely on the universal principle. So you're correct. We're back to square one. Okay, clear? It's almost clear. It's very difficult, but the Gemara went back and forth. But again, this is the concluding words here, that we have two parts of the verse which seem to contradict each other. And the only way to reconcile the contradiction is if we understand that the word aid means two people. How so? Because the verse says, there is no witnesses to the event. And then the verse goes on to say, but she wasn't raped. So if there's no witnesses to the event, how do we know she wasn't raped? So we must conclude that when the verse says there is no witnesses, it means there's no two witnesses. And when the verse says she, was, she wasn't she was raped, the verse is saying, because we have one witness saying that. And that's how we resolve this inherent contradiction. There's no two witnesses, but yes, one witness to the rape, to no rape. So the verse itself implies that you have one witness and we believe that one witness to tell us that there was physical contact, but not rape. Is that clear? That's where we are right now in the Gemara after all the back and forth. All to say, you don't need to rely on the principle that the word aid means a testimony of two because the verse itself implies that you at least have one witness telling you information that you believe. Namely, that she wasn't raped, but she was physical. Which means she willingly engaged, which is why she can't be with her husband. Okay, so why do I need to rely on the universal principle that the word aid means a testimony of two people? Seemingly, the verse itself in Saita implies that. So says the Gemara, this is the last line of this whole uh, pilpul, and tomorrow we're going to get back to more uh, <laughs> straightforward, easier to read the Gemara, it's God willing. So Gemara says like this, it's the, I do need the universal principle. To, and we're right over here. It's the, we do need the, the universal principle to tell me that the word aid means testimony of the plural, because Salka Daito Chamina, that's what this stands for, Samach Da'ad Aleph, Salka Daito Chamina. I would have thought to say, that when the verse says you don't have a witness, it doesn't mean you don't have anybody there. It means you have one person there, but it means a nemanba. It means we don't believe that one person. Adi ikatre until you have two people. Now ubetre nami, and even if you did have two people, the hila has to be she wasn't raped. 
of the wife should be allowed to be with her husband. So in other words, like this, the way we resolve the contradiction, right? There's a contradiction in the verse or seeming contradiction. On the one hand, the verse says, we have no testimony. On the other hand, it says, we know she wasn't raped. So our way of resolving this was very simply. When it says we have no testimony, it means we don't have two people. And when it says that she wasn't raped, it's because we have one person saying that. And that would lead us to the conclusion that the verse itself implies you have one witness. And you don't need the universal principle that the word aid means two. And you believe and you believe that one witness. That one witness, because we're, that's why she's not with her husband, because she wasn't raped. She was willingly engaged by, on the word of that one person, and therefore she can't be with her husband. Now the Gemara is saying there's another way to possibly resolve this contradiction. By saying like this, we have no witnesses because we don't believe one person. Now, even if you had two, we wouldn't make her forbidden unless she wasn't raped. So you have to add that phrase in the middle. Uh, and even if you had two. So this is talking about one. Even we don't believe one witness. Now add this phrase. Even if you had two, it wouldn't make her forbidden unless she wasn't raped. And that's how I could have resolved the contradiction while maintaining that I don't believe even one witness. Because I don't believe one witness. And even if I had two, I wouldn't make her forbidden unless she was unless she was willingly engaged and not raped. So I'm adding that phrase into the verse in order to reconcile it. And in that way, even one witness is not believed. Ah, now comes the Kamash Balan. Now comes the universal principle, which says that the word aid means two. And therefore, when the verse in Saita says, I don't have an aid, I don't have a testimony of two, I do have at least one. And therefore, the Gemara concludes that we do need to rely on the universal principle. Because without the universal principle, I could have read the verse to mean, don't believe anybody, not one witness. I don't believe one witness. Now, as for the fact that I know she wasn't raped, that's talking about when there's two witnesses. That even if I had two witnesses, I wouldn't make her forbidden to her husband unless I know she wasn't raped. So it's not exactly a straightforward reading of the Gemara, but at least it's a reading, it's not a straightforward reading of the verse, but at least it's a word, it's a reading that would be consistent with the universal law that we never, we never believe one witness. And now that I have this principle which says that the word aid means a testimony of two. And our verse says, we don't have a testimony of two, which means we do have a testimony of one. Now we learn the exception. That by sight, we do believe one witness. And this gets back to Jacob's original question, why the, why the verse uh, does this? Why does the verse do this whole thing telling us that we don't have a witness? Uh, the, the, the verse does this because the verse wants to make an exception to the rule here. And even though you don't have a proper testimony, we still believe her. We still believe him and that, that she was engaged physically and cancel the law of the Saita and make her forbidden to her husband. It's all to make an exception to the general rule that we always rely on two witnesses. And that's why the verse has to, has to word it this way. Okay, I hope that was somewhat clear. Um, the Gemara tomorrow is going to be a little bit more straightforward and we won't, we won't have, to, have to do all this. But I hope that was somewhat clear. I hope we enjoyed some of that. Yeah, thank you. Rabbi, if you could just summarize in, 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 in a nutshell, then yeah. the, con the, the, the whole concept here is based on the consequences. Yes. And so as a result, could, could you, if you, if you could wrap it up, then, because uh, on the one hand, you're believing the one witness, yeah. but, you're, but you're not applying as, as you do in, as, as it's done in law, uh, on, on, you, you want to have greater corroboration for anything that would be uh, more severe with regard to, for example, drinking of exactly. Yeah, but so, at the same time, she is excluded from being with her husband. Right. So, the, so, so if, if, if maybe you could put it in that, that that context of the consequences or repercussions that take place due to one or two. Right. That's a good. That's a good point. So we still have to rely on the Gemara's statement earlier that the only reason why the Torah allows for an exception here, that there's one witness, is because we already have a whole history, right? Because let, let's go through the stages of what happens to this woman, right? In the consequence manner, we have we have two witnesses that say he warned her. And we know she was secluded, either on the word of one or the word of two, right? So we already have in the court a record of their uh, uh, problematic marriage, if you will, and the jealousy right. and the problem between them. So we already have a context in which it makes sense that she's been engaged with some other person. And that's the reason why Terry says, in this specific case, you can but rely on one witness. And furthermore, the one witness, the consequences are actually in some way to her benefit, because she doesn't have to go through the hum humiliation of being dragged to the temple to, 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 uh, re to um, drink this water. Even though there are negative consequences too, where she's forbidden to her husband, and maybe she'll have to divorce, 
But considering their, the context of their marriage, maybe that's not the worst thing for her. They're already in a rocky relationship. So it's not as if we're, we're, God forbid, doing capital punishment as a result of one witness. All we're doing is, is we're saving her the embarrassment of drinking this thing in public. You know, they tear her clothing and all the things that the Gemara is going to describe later. They uncover her hair. It's, not, it's a humiliating experience. So we're, we're, we have, A, we have context because we already have, know that they have a problematic marriage. So we have context in which we would believe, in which it would make sense she was engaged physically. That's number one. Number two, we're actually saving her the embarrassment of the law of the Saita. And as for the fact that she's becoming forbidden to her husband, maybe it's not the worst thing for her. Maybe it's time for her to move on. So maybe that's the reason why Torah is giving an exception and allowing us to believe one witness, even though we don't usually, even though we usually would not. Perhaps. Thank you, Rabbi. It actually is very, very interesting from the perspective of, in the same way that any court uh, that would, God forbid, take the life of someone was considered to be hanged. In this particular instance, it just shows how each time there's a desire yeah. to ensure that the law is recognizing the truth, but at the same time that the severity is lowered to ensure that our human instincts are such that we demonstrate a sense of sensitivity even in the worst of situations. Yeah, so just to back up your point even more, I'll tell you, this is an interesting phenomenon that people have a hard time sometimes grappling with. <clears throat> On the one hand, Torah says that someone who violates Shabbos is capital punishment. And people ask, like, it's very harsh, right? But, and, and the response always is, well, look at the rabbinic literature. And in rabbinic literature, you'll see that uh, capital punishment for Violating Shabbos is very difficult to implement and almost never is implemented, right? Okay, so that's usually the answer. But the question then becomes, well, if it's barely ever implemented, then why is the Torah's scripture only so harsh, right? And, and the answer, I read this from, uh, I think I heard this from Rabbi Emmanuel Shachat of Blessed Memory. I think it was from him that I heard this. The Torah is telling you two things. First of all, the Torah wants you to know that you know how bad violation of Shabbos is. It's so bad that it should be capital punishment. Now, in reality, we don't want to give capital punishment, so we're going to find ways to make sure it never happens to you. But you should know that's how bad it is. Right? So it's almost like the Torah on the one hand, like you're saying. We want to know the strictness of the law. You should know this is how bad that, that act is. It's so bad that this is the kind of punishment Torah prescribes. On the other hand, we want to take every person's uh, circumstance into consideration, and we want to make sure we're not actually abusing this strictness of the law. We want to have systems in place to make sure that we barely ever implement capital punishment and so on and so forth. Notwithstanding the fact that in theory, this is how bad that act is, right? So it's kind of this balance. Yeah. It's, 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 it's brilliant, Rabbi, because at the same time, it provokes and brings about the necessity of deterrence in that way. Correct, exactly. Torah is telling you that's how bad this is. And they yeah. never do that. Now, if you did, we're gonna make sure you don't get the punishment, but you should know how bad it is. Right. God should bless you, Rabbi. Yeshikoa, and God bless you all. What a beautiful Havruta we have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, really, really a, a joy. Thank God we have, um, we have Zoom uh, to be able to continue even in times like this. Amen. Amen. Have a, 